Uh, one of the areas that we're looking at is how we can better understand and manage the energy consumption of all of our systems. So we're very lucky as a centre that we have a, a wide range of really interesting architectures. So th this is a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, in summary, we have, um, as I say, a range of novel architectures. So starting with, uh, we have an ARM-based 64-bit uh, system, an FPGA system from Maxella, uh, GPU accelerating uh, systems. We've now got two Power8 uh, systems on site at Hartree. Uh, a range of different storage architectures, a uh, range of different configurations. So we have air-cooled, water-cooled. We even have an oil-cooled machine as well. A uh, range of uh, different uh, batch-type environments as well. But in terms of the en energy-efficient computing program, we've got four key areas of investigation. So what we're looking at is we're looking at energy-efficient hardwares, we're looking at um, en energy ware management software, energy-efficient applications and infrastructure. And we try to tie these all together through the uh, Tessero project. So the drivers for the project, in terms of the, those... Um, different architectures that we have at the centre. We actually have three machine rooms and it costs us in the region of three quarters of a million pounds each year to run those particular systems. So we're keen to optimise those systems and reduce the overall energy cost where we can. <coughs> Obviously the key piece for us is to, to do more with less basically, to drive the amount of science that we can do while reducing the overall cost. Uh, and this isn't just a problem that's faced by HPC centres like Hartree. It's also a challenge for large-scale, hyperscale data centres as well. So one of the things we've looked to do is to try and implement a system that will allow us to accurately measure and monitor uh, the power at different, um, different levels within the data centre and enable us to actually start to characterise those architectures in terms of their overall performance and energy consumption and do uh, a comparison of those architectures as well. Uh, so power monitoring of the compute and the supporting in infrastructure for us in terms of the TCO is very important. So in terms of the project itself, there's a number of key areas. Uh, we're looking at how we can develop the capabilities um, around measurement and characterisation, as I've already said. That's a key part of it. Um, Embercosm, who are going to be sp speaking next, are looking at the compiler opportunities there, how we can use machine learning and a technique called super optimization to identify optimum um, compilation options. Uh, again, to find the sweet spot between overall performance and energy consumption. We're looking at application profiling, so we're working with Alinea uh, and their tools to see how we can better profile applications to again understand the performance and the energy consumption. And we're also looking at monitoring the whole data centre. So we've installed um, current transformers on all of our boards. We're also taking direct data via IPMI uh, and other protocols from not just the compute systems, but also the supporting architectures in the room, like the air conditioning, so that we can get a complete picture of the, of the energy cost associated with running particular jobs. In terms of... Um, Environmental monitoring, we're also looking at um, temperature and humidity to understand how when we schedule jobs on different systems, when they run, how they affect the environmental conditions, and then ultimately how we can optimise uh, the data centres um, by using all of this information combined, taking information about the particular job runs as well. We can hope to optimise our data centres, optimise our applications, um, and ultimately get better value for money in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the jobs that we run. An observation we made some years ago from some early research was that the choice of optimization options when you compile a program can influence quite significantly the amount of energy that program consumes. We came into this project having completed a previous project looking at how machine learning to train a compiler on what optimizations were best for energy worked with deeply embedded systems and the question is can that same technology work with high performance computing systems can we actually take your molecular modeling software your earthquake simulator and recompile it so it runs just as fast but uses less energy and reduces your electricity bill the work is done with STFC so clearly focuses on HPC but the wider application is the data center market 
given that Google and Amazon spend a billion dollars a year on electricity, even if we can just make the programs 1% more efficient, that's a lot of money. So the first approach is a straight machine learning approach. We take a wide range of programs representative of the sort of programs running on the target system. We compile them with a huge range of options and measure how much energy they use. And that's where our colleagues from Alinea, uh, David Lacombe will speak to you in a minute, and their map uh, tool come along because that supplies the energy data. And we can use a standard machine learning algorithm to learn what sorts of source code compile best for energy with what sort of options. And that means then in the future, you come along with a new program, we can look at that machine learning database and say, given what your source code looks like, these are the optimizations you, you want. And it's designed to be as technology neutral as it can be. So it works through plug-in and similar interfaces. So you can run it with GCC and LLVM, which is what we've done for this project. You can run it with any other compiler where you have control over the options that are used for optimization. You can plug it into your favorite machine learning system. We've used a C5 classifier, but we've also experimented with uh, genetic algorithms and, uh, uh, and nearest neighbor approaches. Um, so you can choose what works best for you. That's the machine learning side of this project. We're at the stage where reworking all the infrastructure so it works on great big high performance computing systems can take advantage of the parallelism. That's all up and working. Our colleagues uh, in Hartree and research colleagues at Bristol University are working with that. In the last five or six months of the project comes the big time when we actually run it on real applications uh, with our colleagues at Hartree to see actually does it deliver when you give it real world problems. The second side of this is super optimization. How many people here have heard of super optimization? I'm glad my colleagues have. Right, okay. It's a very simple idea. It's nearly 30 years old. When you optimize with a compiler, you're not making optimal code, you're just making better code. And 30 years ago, the question was asked, I wonder what the truly very best translation you could do is. And the solution proposed by Henry Maslin was exhaustive search. I will try all sequences of one instruction and see if they do the same thing. Then I'll try all sequences of two instructions and I will keep going until I find a sequence that does the same thing. It's a very simple approach. It is computationally a nightmare. Now, that has been used. There are a couple of... Uh, super optimizers out there that are now 20 years old, a hacker's assistant, also known as AHA, and the best known of all, the GNU super optimizer. But a lot of work has gone on in the background. It's an area where people keep on thinking, if only we could solve this, it would be quite good. And two or three years ago, Innovate UK funded a short study by us where we came to the conclusion that this is actually now a technology that's applicable in the real world. You can use various heuristic criteria to tackle programs of a meaningful size, by which I mean tens of instructions. But that can be the inner loop of a critical program. If you can improve that, that's fine. Super-optimization then seems to have some applicability for performance um, optimization. We're trying to say, can we do it for energy optimization as well? And I give you not an explanation of super optimization because I can't do that in five minutes, but just one example, the original example. The program on the left is a simple test of, given an argument, return zero if it's zero, minus one if it's negative, and plus one if it's positive. And you can compile for a cold fire processor, the old Motorola 68000, and a modern optimizing compiler will generate the code in the middle. Uh, eight or not, about eight instructions and a couple of branches. Perfectly good translation. If you give it to a super optimizer, it will discover that because of clever properties of the uh, uh, carry flags, if you do clever carrying arithmetic, you can do it in four instructions with no branches. Um, you can take that example away and convince yourself it really does work. Um, that's the potential super optimization has. It's been used recently with OpenSSL, applied to the Montgomery multiplication kernel, which is the modular multiplication in OpenSSL, to give a 
performance improvement. And that's a big thing in something that's critical to most compiler infrastructure. So we're applying that. And the big breakthrough we've made in this project is the GNU Super Optimizer 2.0 which this is a parallel problem, but no one's ever done it in parallel. So we now have a highly parallelized implementation so we can take the big machines at Hartree and actually use them to solve the problem of super optimizing to run code on them in, in turn. There is one final part of this project, um, which wasn't really mentioned at the beginning, which is, like a lot of Innovate UK projects, there is a, an aspiration to encourage the next generation. So... This infrastructure is being used by MSC projects at Bristol University. But I want you to draw, draw your attention to a younger student. Um, we're looking at energy, we're using a linear map, but it would be really nice if we could actually get inside one of these computers and measure at much finer detail exactly what the energy is doing. And we're not allowed to take apart the Blue Gene Q and put energy probes in it because we might break it. So we asked a 16-year-old student who, are, who was working for us over the summer, if he could build us a supercomputer. And this is a stack of 16 Pine 64 boards, each costing $21, plugged in via gigabit Ethernet to a 24-port switch. And that actually offers all the characteristics of a big supercomputer. I mean, it'd easily be beaten by a, 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 an average desktop these days but it has the same balance of compute bound and communication bound as a big computer. And it allows us to put probes on there knowing that if we blow up a board, it's cost us $21. Um, and we can get much finer sampling to help us refine our algorithms. Um, and that's an example of, if you don't tell a 16 year old, they're not supposed to be able to design supercomputers the way they go and do that. Um, the design is fully open and hopefully we've got another engineer on the track to becoming an HPC engineer in the future. So we're all about monitoring and managing in the data center. So essentially we take data from the building itself, from the environmentals within the building, from temperature, humidity sensors, things like that. We take things at the rack level, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we take information at the rack level, from the server level and the operating system level and bring this all together in a single, what they call a single dashboard. So we speak a number of protocols, SNMP for monitoring typical uh, computing system, access management systems, PDU management, server health monitoring, and other facilities devices, such as air conditioning units and the like. Uh, we talk Windows management instrumentation to get information off Windows machines, whether it's operating systems, virtual machines, or applications. We speak Modbus, which is an old serial protocol for getting information off typically facilities devices, uh, big distribution boards, uh, generators, um, uh, backup systems. Um, we speak IPMI, which I guess you all know of, which is for server health monitoring, for finding things like, uh, sorry, uh, for finding information about fan speeds, uh, and particularly energy these days, you can get most energy readings from c uh, servers themselves. And then we speak a protocol called OneWire, which is a very low-cost uh, mechanism for getting uh, information of lots of small, uh, small um, sensors, so temperature, humidity sensors. So what we essentially then do is pick up all of this information from all over the data center to provide a view of what's going on at the data center. So we can then do things like dashboards, giving people knowledge of what's going on at a macro level or a, a, a micro level. Uh, we can give you ideas of what's happening in racks, statistical information about the power used by racks, CPU utilization, whatever it may be that's happening in a rack, you can um, see it from a graphical point of view and a high level point of view. Uh, we can also then dig down into the rack view. So we have full asset management with our product and we have uh, the ability to connect assets together, either through, through power chain management, so knowing which power devices are connected to which power distribution boards, which themselves may be connected to high-level power distribu distribution boards. We also do the same thing for network management, so we know what switches are connected to which uh, other switches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we can not only monitor this information, but if we're able to 
um, send control messages to this hardware. So for example, SNMP has a write capability, Modbus has a write pet capability, IPMI allows you to control things, uh, and things like smart PDUs also allow you to turn sockets on and off, etc. etc. We can then actively control aspects of the data center. And we do this with a workflow management system. So that's the kind of thing we do. I'm sorry it's so, so brief, <laughs> uh, but it's quite a lot. Uh, within TSERO, our aim is to kind of measure end-to-end -end energy utilization uh, at the IT systems and facilities device level. So anything from uh, operating systems, um, IT systems, so servers, switches, etc., and uh, it's, uh, <coughs> our other partners that go below that into the applications themselves, if you like. So part of the aim of the project is to reduce the energy used by the data center as a whole. So there's something called PUE, power usage effectiveness, and that's something we're looking at with uh, SDFC, see if we can improve that. We're also looking at mechanisms for improving or providing total energy costs to users of heart tree systems on a per user, per group, and per job basis. Uh, for those who, in the audience who don't know Alinea, um, I know we've We've we, uh, obviously been uh, doing tools in HPC for, for many years and uh, have good relationships with a lot of the UK HPC community. Um, we basically provide two uh, sets of products for the HPC world, one of which is Alinea Forge, which contains our debugger and our profiler. So DDT is uh, the debugger. It's used around the world. Uh, machines that are the largest machines out there, including things like Titan, Blue Waters, Archer in the UK. Um, and MAP also is our profiler, also widely used. Um, both of these tools are scalable tools aiming at people who are developing code, either to fix bugs with that or to make them run faster. So um, very well known for those. Uh, performance reports is our, the newest of our products, actually about four years old now, um, and this um, presents uh, performance information to users um, in a more digestible way for people who are users rather than developers of HPC systems. People get very confused about performance, so we provided a, a single thing that could point them in the right direction and give them some good advice. So, for example, we would tell you whether I.O. is your biggest problem, what you were getting out of there, what to do about that. Same, same with the way the CPUs were using. We could say, you're spending too much time in memory accesses. Do something about that, um, or, you know, or MPI, etc. And to these tools, um, we brought a little bit of an energy things. Um, so we're based in Warwick, um, and it's always been about innovating and bringing good stuff out to HPC, uh, and particularly helping people to get more out of what they do. And when it came to energy, energy was one of the R&D things that we thought, well, this would be good stuff to do. It's a future topic people are really interested in. We started out, so the work we're presenting here is something we started out or four years ago, I think now, with Warwick University and one of the PhD students there, who uh, it was a TSB-funded project, Technology Strategy Board. Uh, I think they're now Innovate UK. Um, it's a government body that, that helps co-fund uh, research. And there, we didn't really know how we were going to measure energy, but we came to uh, uh, try several different approaches, heuristics, real measurement, all those things, and came up with the best thing. So we actually brought that out as a product. So it was like the first product on the market to let people profile or op optimize their energy within the applications. Now looking at the system, looking at the applications, which is unusual, that's where Alinea fits in. And we, we, we found we were quite ahead of the curve in this, so we started sharing those experiences with other um, sites that are really keen on energy. So the Energy Efficiency HPC Working Group, which is a largely driven by the DOE in the US, and with Hartree, and a place like LRZ in, in Germany. And we found, ultimately, there's a lot of benefit can be had from things like frequency scaling. So that kind of um, correlated with a lot, of, a lot of other people were experiencing. And also from just making the code run faster. So very often, if you're optimizing for time, you're also optimizing for energy. But that's not always the case. Frequency scaling, whereby you slow the processor down to match the speed at which the memory can actually feed that processor. Or the I.O., for example, could feed that processor, will actually save energy. And at one of the follow-up events to that project, or the end uh, meeting of, of, of that project, there was a gathering of all the companies that have been involved in these kinds of projects. And um, we met with Ember Cosm and Hartree. We already knew Concertum and their products at that point. Um, and we had this sort of what-if moment. Why don't we bring together three SMEs from the UK, 
and one of the UK's leading research centers and do something about that. Um, so what we did was we enabled our profiler to help, because we figured we'd done all the work of working with HPC systems, working with the applications, providing data, and here it was, it was in our little island. Like, that's no good, let's get more people able to use this. And so we've um, added a lot more exporting capability, so getting some JSON there, some CSV, the ability to push to things. And that was absolutely essential for enabling Jeremy's company to take that data and figure out which functions were the ones to target your super optimization at. We could say, this function is using the most energy, go, go forth and you know, burn a lot of CPU hours, but create something more efficient for the future when this is deployed. And uh, so really narrowed it down. Um, we were actually finding that was a useful thing to do in practice, and people who have no interest in energy, but interested in doing other cool things with with their code are now really keen on, on gathering that data, using it for other, other purposes. We also um, feed what we've measured into um, cluster management and data center management tools. Um, we're able to take in data from those, and so we are feeding a concertum uh, outputs that can then be put into things like Ganglia. In practice, we found that that didn't work quite so well because Ganglia doesn't like you putting in data historically, it rather likes it to be fresh data that goes in. And the way we work is to only collect data at the very end of the job in order to be more efficient. But that was a learning experience, and other, other systems don't have that issue. Um, and finally, uh, a really important point was to prove that this work could be useful on something other than Intel. Uh, so we worked on Intel. We already supported things like Rappel, which is their package level uh, power API, which users can see. Uh, but we also have IPMI support uh, in there. For the other platforms, the, the support was really, really quite weak. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there was no sort of Rappel equivalent. So on those systems, we're using IPMI. But we're also working with the vendors to try and encourage them to do better things in the future and uh, push for really useful APIs that will enable people to actually profile, you know, how's my, how is my energy in this, uh, in this application run? Uh, you know, where is it going? Is it in the memory or is it in the processor? Is it in the I.O. or the accelerator, et cetera?